Um, my name is Kimberly Allen, and um, I am, give me one second. Sorry about that. Uh, so my name is Kim Allen and I'm the CEO of 90 Forward. And uh, we, I've been in this role now for five, almost six months, um, which is hard to believe as the CEO. Oh, sorry, I hit the mute button by accident. And I've, I've been a part of the organization though since 2016, um, first as a member and then as the board chair starting in 2018. And so uh, our organization is committed to helping in racism so that everyone thrives. And we do that by helping people to have the difficult dialogue around race, um, helping people to build relationships and then moving together towards collective action. I mean, we, we have, I would call it two uh, really key uh, pockets of, of activities that we've been doing to, to help people to have conversations about race. One is what's called the race cards. And it's literally a deck of playing cards that have uh, discussion questions on one side of them. And it ranges on topics. So there, is a, there are personal questions where we are talking about things like, uh, when did you first become aware of your racial identity? Uh, we have philosophical questions, things like, um, when, what role does fear play in people's understanding of race and racism? Um, and then we have topical questions around things like the Confederate uh, monuments uh, and what should happen to them. Um, and so we have been, we started and launched those cards back in 2018. And we have been hosting conversations since then. And we've had, uh, we've sold the decks at this point. At this point, I think we're probably close to having sold almost 4,000 decks of cards across the country. We've launched a, an app for the cards and everything. Um, and uh, it really has been what we call an entry level way for people to discuss race. Um, I saw in the document that Dennis shared um, that there are a lot of people who, you want to come with me? So there, there are a lot of, uh, the, the document that Dennis shared talked about people being on their own journeys, right? And we very much believe in that. Uh, when you enter the space to have a race cards conversation, you are not coming you know, empty handed. We all have our experiences and things that you bring to those conversations. And we try to set the scene and set the stage such that folks know that this is the beginning. Um, this is not the only thing that should be happening um, to move towards racial reconciliation, but it is one step of many. And it is an entry point for folks who might have some anxiety um, we're talking about race or who are just, you know, starting to dip their toe in the water, so to speak. Um, and so we, we've held those conversations. Um, the second bucket that we have um, of work that we're doing is called um, the Jacksonville Community Remembrance Project. And we call it JCRP because it's a mouthful. Um, and that's in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative over in Montgomery, Alabama uh, with Mr. Brian Stevenson. And we uh, memorialize victims of terror lynchings. And so uh, Jacksonville right now has documented seven uh, lynching events. And, and let me preface this by saying, uh, we know that, that this number is probably very underreported. The EJI has a strict criteria that they use to define what is considered terror lynching. And so we, based on that definition, we have seven instances with eight victims. Um, and they were all uh, murdered between 1860 and 1930. Um, and uh, so what we do is we start with a soil collection for each one of those victims, uh, where we literally go to the spot where the victim was lynched and collect the dirt and put it in a jar that goes to the museum in Montgomery. And we keep a jar here in Jacksonville and we are uh, in the process of looking for a permanent home for those uh, jars. Um, but the idea there is uh, for all we know, the soil that, that is there still uh, houses the blood of that victim. Um, and so after we uh, hold soil collection ceremonies for each one of the victims, uh, we plan to uh, work with the city to put up historical markers in those areas where the lynchings occurred 
Um, and the, the big picture goal is to uh, bring or claim the pillar that uh, is at the National Museum for Peace and Justice in Montgomery. It's literally a really big steel monument with the names etched in them um, and around the time that they were deceased. Um, and we want to bring that here and sort of create a space similar if you've, if you've been to the museum in Alabama, similar to the very reflective uh, space that exists there. And so we, we really, um, we are near the end of hosting all of those soil collection ceremonies. We have two left um, that will take place in December of this year and February of next year. Um, from the last count I saw, there are about 33 other victims that we want to submit to consideration uh, for consideration to EJI. And so they will have to tell us if it meets their criteria. Um, and then we will start the process over again to memorialize those victims. I um, mean, we've been hosting those virtually. And after those events take place, uh, we have um, hosted what's called, what we call caring circles, which is a time for people to come together who witnessed the soil collection ceremonies, which are very moving and uh, can be very emotional. Um, we have spoken word poetry, there's prayer and meditation, there's singing, and it really is um, a very sacred time um, for us to memorialize those folks. And it feels like we're giving them a proper burial. Um, and it feels like we're recognizing and acknowledging that we don't want this to happen again. But the way we do that is to have the conversation and tell the truth about what happened so that we know, you know um, how we can all work together and, and move forward. Um, and so those are two key programs. We have lots of other things coming down the pipeline, especially as next year is Jacksonville's bicentennial. Um, so uh, we're we're really excited. What is your uh, long term goal, Zona? Uh, uh, so honestly, it, and this this is one of the things that we have struggled a little bit with, but. Ultimately, we want racism to be done. We want it to end, right? And someone said to me, is that really feasible? And the answer I always say is, even if it's not feasible, is it not something that we should strive towards? Like we should always be striving to be better human beings for each other and for race not to be the deciding factor in certain outcomes. And so the goal is for racism to go away or at least be um, uh, racism to be so minimized that it does not uh, impact the uh, different outcomes for folks. That's wonderful. Any questions for Ms. Allen? All right, well, thank, thank you so much. Oh, I was I, waiting. Yeah, well, I just got to watch your soil collection ceremony, the, other, the recent one, and certainly appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. We are always happy to have folks. And if it's helpful after this, I can send the videos that you all can watch. They've been recorded on Zoom. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, Kyle. Well, thank you all. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me uh, share this time with you. Um, my story is a little bit like Kimberly's in that I was... Uh, I became a member of the One Jacks Board of Directors somewhere around 2009 uh, and served on that board as well as board chair. And then when this opportunity uh, came for me to go on staff, uh, that was a good time in my life and career to do that. Uh, prior to joining One Jacks, I was the senior pastor of Hendricks Avenue Baptist here in Jacksonville for 14 years. So um, I'll just give you a high level overview of uh, the, the work, the, of some of the work that we do that I think is appropriate to tonight's conversation. Um, we start um, really young. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, diversity conversations and programs now that are expanding into middle school as well as high school. Um, our signature program is our summer camp called Metro Town, which is a four-day camp 
held in the summer that uh, explores all types of diversity and difference and begins to have those conversations about, you know, how do we live together as a community and how do we celebrate each human being uh, and their own um, uh, individual gifts, abilities, all of those different things. Uh, we are now expanding. We've just hired a middle school coordinator and our middle school work will uh, center not only just on Metro Town, but we do something called Metro Town in a day. And that is when um, typically a, a school has experienced uh, an issue. Uh, we were called in uh, last year uh, before the pandemic uh, down to Ponte Vedra. There was a really ugly incident, uh, incidents of anti-Semitism. And so we, we go in and our youth team uh, does a day long training, typically on a Saturday or a teacher planning day. Uh, and that's generated by faculty or administration. And Deidre Lane, who leads our youth programs, has a wonderful uh, relationship with, with a lot of teachers and administrators. The, the final area of youth work that we do is uh, diversity training. Um, and so we will go into a school and typically it will be an individual teacher who will ask us to come and in Duval County, uh, that teacher will give us his or her A and B days. So we're there Monday and Tuesday, we cover all of the classes and we do a 90 minute diversity education block. And um, so then continue to build out that program uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, in, in a year, we reached between four and 5,000 students. And now being able to expand our staff uh, we, uh, we look forward to reaching more people. And sadly enough, in the world we live in, we know that there's enough work for us to do that. So uh, that, that's the work that we do in middle and high school. Um, the, the next thing I would mention is Project Breakthrough. Um, in 2008, the Aspen Institute, along with the Community Foundation of Northeast Florida, One Jacks and other organizations, uh, brought a project breakthrough to community leaders. At that time, it was a 72 hour uh, retreat setting that talked about structural racism. Um, and so out of that uh, project breakthrough then was, um, uh, was, we were asked to be stewards of that program. And so uh, we do uh, Project Breakthrough. Uh, it does look at structural racism. Uh, Councilwoman Brenda Priestley Jackson is our project coordinator uh, in that work. Uh, and so given the racial reckoning that's been happening over the last year, uh, we have had a, a remarkable opportunity to uh, present uh, Project Breakthrough into, into places and into people that might uh, surprise you. We did a uh, two to three hour project breakthrough uh, session with the Jacksonville Civic Council. Um, we are in the process of doing project breakthrough. Uh, Melissa Nelson's goal is that every um, uh, attorney in the state attorney's office will have gone through project breakthrough with us. Again, COVID sort of derailed that a little bit. We got, we've got started and we will circle back on that. Um, also, uh, we have delivered Project Breakthrough uh, to, in the UNF College of Education so that every student teacher that is going out into Jacksonville, many of them going into the urban core have an understanding of uh, uh, the, the structural nature uh, of racism. And so Project Breakthrough is, is a program that we offer. And I just would, would point out to you, one of the, the, the outgrowths of that is um, that the state attorney's office uh, took a map of Jacksonville and all of the um, neighborhoods that were redlined post-World War II, all of these things. And then you look at crime statistics, it, it's like one map duplicating the other. And so the state attorney's office begins to say, okay, 
when we are dealing with crime in these areas, there's more to it than just an individual doing something. So that's sort of a, a, a very tangible uh, outgrowth of, of the work that Brenda and her team do. So, so we're able to do that. And the final thing I would mention is um, we have a growing body of work uh, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and so we are working with a, a lot of companies in the city uh, to help them uh, appreciate diversity, diversity, recognizing it, and, and how do we begin to listen and to talk to each other. Um, our, our latest work that we did just last week was with the Tom Coughlin J Fund, and we're helping them craft an inclusivity statement that talks about not just who they are, but who their patients are, who their patients' families are, and what they can expect from each other as far as respect uh, across all sorts of difference. So those are, we do other, other things. Uh, we have the good fortune of having uh, Dr. Kimberly Allen as one of our community supper leaders the last time we did that virtually, but those are the areas that I think are, are pertinent to the conversation tonight. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Kyle. <clears throat> and I'll ask both of you, um, to what extent have you observed the, the material I sent around talks about a change of heart? To what extent have you observed that happening and what appears to be the thing that moves it the most? I'll let you answer first, Kyle. <laughs> well, I, so we, given the, the racial reckoning that happened, um, we did, we, this is how we, we move forward in our organization. And that was, I would argue that the first thing that white folks should do is listen a lot. And so we brought our team together, our African-American staff members told their story and that was our team, our board and our senior advisory. Um, and that was just such a powerful uh, moment for us that that's what we adopted to do to any organization that asked us to do that. So I'll, I'll just tell you one story with the Jacksonville Civic Council, which is a group of CEOs from all over the city. We invited them to do um, that with their group. And so they invited their African-American members to sort of tell their story. Um, and um, one African-American member was talking about during the pandemic, he flew into Jacksonville from a meeting late at night and he works at a particular institution that requires name badges. And so he specifically put his name badge on his jacket so that in the event that he was pulled over, the officer would see, you know, with whom he worked and who he was. And what was so powerful about that is um, many people on that call had no idea that people they view as their peers live with that every day. And then you'll appreciate this because you realize who are on that call. Um, one uh, particular person said, well, well, that's just unacceptable. We need to decide among this group that we're gonna stop that. And you know, okay, that, 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 that's good, that, that is a big audacious goal, but it was just that powerful hearing someone just authentically tell, this is my reality. Um, and uh, my colleague, Mickey Brown um, does a lot of, you know, we talk a lot about privilege and I love her def definition. She says, privilege is that which you can do in your life that you don't have to think about. And when people hear what someone of color or whatever the case may be has to think about in order to live their life that they don't, it's very powerful. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, you know, I, I could not agree more with Kyle. It's the that storytelling piece is just so profound because it's people who, uh, you know, they they go to happy hour together, right? They work next to each other every single day, yet uh, there is still some layer of wall that usually exists between people, particularly when you're talking about. Um, across racial lines that people just don't really get into and don't really talk about. And one of the, one of the things that has been so profound um, in terms of, of some of the change of, of heart and things that I've seen, one has been, um, I, we had a group, this was a, a, a company, like a, a, an insurance company who their colleagues had done it, their leadership had done some of our race car training, they're bringing it to their one of their ERG groups. And uh, someone in the group said, well, you know, my parents would say all kinds of things about people from different races. And I knew that was wrong and I never said that. And so, you know, I, I in some ways feel better, right? Because I haven't done those things, I haven't said those things. And so one of the African-American members of the group said, so you might not have said those things, but what are the things that you might've done subconsciously as a result of being exposed to those things that you probably didn't even realize? And in that moment, she kind of paused and she got choked up a little bit because she, she said, well, she said, I, I don't want to say aloud, you know, but she was like, but you're absolutely right. There are absolutely things that I've thought and I've done out of automatic, just, uh, you know, not realizing that even though I wasn't saying the words or, you know, out loud that maybe my parents uh, were saying as I was growing up, there are still things that I had in my heart that I didn't realize were there. And so that's a lot of what, uh, of what we've seen because the, the cool thing is that people get to, I, I say this and, and it's not contrarian, but I, people get to make each other uncomfortable, right? To really push each other, each other to think about the deepest corners that may not be uh, exposed, not even to yourself. And so when that happens, you know, people tend to get a little emotional in particular because nobody wants to be thought of as racist. Um, that's, that is the buzzword that will kill your whole career, your whole social life, um, if you get that label. But thinking about those, again, those little nuances and those things and those ways you might have acted, the areas that you might have avoided, the crossing the street because you saw somebody who looked suspicious to you, um, those things, somebody helping to point those things out um, can really go a long way. And, but that only happens with that storytelling, right, Kyle? Like when people are feeling safe enough to be vulnerable to share those things. And, and I think, Kimberly, I think you're so right. And, and when people say, um, you know, I wanna get together and do more than talk I sort of cringe at that because I understand there's action, but I see what listening and talking can do. Um, and, and so I don't want to sell that short. Plus, I, the first 30 years of my career, I was a preacher who got paid to get up and talk to people. So I never want to diminish the fact that talking and listening is important. Yeah, it definitely goes a long way, Kyle. It goes a long way. And, and I see people who, and I know you do too, who want to rush to that? What What do I do? And I always tell people, start with I. You know, start with yourself. What is it that I can do to be better? What are the blind spots that I have that I don't even recognize? Um, and because our organization is still largely, you know, centered on volunteers, the thing that I've said about anybody who volunteers with our organization is, I don't want you to come in here thinking that you're just going to go out and do something in the community, and racism is just going to end. Like it starts with you. So there are things that we have baked into our orientation process that makes our volunteers reflect on themselves and how they can be better and how they can identify their blind spots. Because if we're not careful, right, we can go out in the community and do more harm than good, just not being aware. And we don't ever want to be a part of the problem. We want to be a part of the solution. But that has to start with, with oneself. 
with myself, with yourself, and so on. Well, thank you both. I'm going to uh, turn the recording off now and just and then ask folks uh, if they'd like to ask questions and just start our dialogue. So.